Hello, this is the final lecture about ultrasound transducer and beam forming consents. And how about I start that again rather than yeah. sorry. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm only doing that in the first part of the uh, summer. Anyway. Hello, this is the uh, third lecture and final lecture about ultrasound transducers and beam forming concepts. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about some of the limitations of the beam forming and some of the related artifacts that we can get from this. So we'll be talking about the beam width and detail resolution. We'll talk about slice thickness, side lobes and grating lobes. So we talked about, in the last lecture we talked about what the beam looks like and how it's focused. And most of the images were shown in this sort of two-dimensional plane. Whereas well, a matter of fact, it's not a two-dimensional plane at all, it's a three-dimensional structure. Now the ultrasound machine doesn't think of it like this, unfortunately. It thinks of it as a single straight line, which is sort of an infinitesimally small sort of piece of string, if you like. Whereas actually there's this structure to the such as the beam width, so that it has both a so it has both a, a height and a width, if you like, as well. And the, the basic premise is that any structure that's seen within that sort of section in, in both sort of a height and width format is going to produce a reflection. If we try and think about detail resolution, there's also going to be a sort of a a minimum width that we can look at two separate structures along that, both in an axial plane, which is in the sort of direction of the ultrasound travel, as well as a lateral plane, as well as an elevation plane. So let's consider each of those, uh, those things in detail. So let's first of all start off with the axial resolution. So as an ultrasound is emitted from the transducer, to try, and, uh, to try and tell the difference between two structures that are in that plane, that's known as the axial resolution. Remember that for B mode and sort of M mode images, we're sending out pulses of ultrasound. To try and tell the difference between two structures, they therefore have to be greater than the spatial length, spatial pulse length divided by two. Because otherwise, that pulse length is going to overlap between the two structures, and we will not be able to tell them apart. So that means that if we can reduce that spatial pulse length, we're going to be able to have better resolution. And I've mentioned this concept a few times in the previous lectures. And that all comes down to, again, frequency and wavelength. With higher frequencies, we're going to have smaller wavelengths, which means we're going to have better resolution. But again, with higher frequencies, we're going to have better resolution, but we're going to have reduced penetration because of increased attenuation. Next, let's consider lateral resolution. So lateral resolution is our ability to uh, determine the difference between two structures that are close together, but doing it in the plane that is perpendicular to the direction that the ultrasound wave is traveling. Okay, and this is all to do with beam width, and it's going to be best in that focal zone of that ultrasound beam. It's going to be improved with focusing, whether that's from a mechanical or an electrical means, that will both improve our lateral resolution. It's important to remember that axial resolution is better than lateral resolution in the majority of circumstances. 
And this is kind of sort of tried to display it in the, in the second of those two images, the one on the bottom there, where we can see in the middle the two dots are separated. That's the actual distance that those two dots are apart. On the left, uh, on the left ultrasound beam, we can see one that's maybe not focused as well. And we can see that those two structures are seen as just one dot, as opposed to the uh, image on the right, which is meant to be focused better. And that's where we can see the two structures are still separate, because we've got better focusing, we've got better lateral resolution. Uh, and finally, in terms of trying to separate two markers, let's consider slice thickness. So this is the ability to try and resolve two structures that are in the elevation uh, of the beam width. And again, it's just to try and, uh, try and reiterate the fact that the beam is a three-dimensional structure. And we've got to try and resolve images both in the axial plane, the lateral plane, and in the elevation plane. And if you get a structure that's uh, smaller than the elevation plane of the beam width, that's again just going to come across as, uh, th that's going to be able to generate an echo uh, no matter what. So as well as talking about structures that are separated by a distance, we also need to consider structures that are separated in time because, for instance, looking at things like echocardiography, we're often looking at moving structures. And the aim is to try and get uh, that structure moving as, uh, moving as uh, in, a, in a fluid motion so that we try not to see a, a static jump. For instance, if you're trying to see what the, uh, see what the vena contractor is or you want to try and see the uh, depth when, the, uh, when valves are uh, at their sort of smallest uh, closing together. If we're trying to look at a regurgitant jet through there, we want to try and pick up that jet as accurately as possible, in which case we need to get, make sure the timing is as accurate as possible. So this is where temporal resolution comes in, and it's all dependent on frame rate, which is number of frames per second. So again, we're sending out pulsed ultrasound waves to pick up some of the B-mode imaging or the pulse wave Doppler. And this is going to be dependent on the pulsed ultrasound, and we're going to therefore be limited to a certain extent about sending out that pulse. We know that if we want to image it at a certain depth, we have to send out that pulse, hear the echo come back, and we know that we've got to send out a certain number of lines to form the image. So we're going to be dependent on forming our frame rate on both your pulse repetition frequency, the depth that you're trying to image, and the number of lines that you want to form in that image. And this is where we can start forming a, an equation to try and figure out what the maximum frame rate is. So if we say that penetrance, or depth that we're trying to image, times by the line density, times by the frame rate, is going to be dependent on the speed of the ultrasound that it's traveling through. And remember, that sound is not about, it's about getting to the structure we're trying to image, and it has to come back. So we divide that by two. So we obviously can't change the speed in tissue, we know that the ultrasound wave is assumed to be traveling at 1,540 meters per second. So if we want to increase up the frame rate, we're therefore going to need to reduce either the penetrance, or the depth that we're trying to image, or the line density. And the way that we classically try to reduce the line density is you can reduce your sector width of what you're trying to image. So again, that kind of equation to try and remember is penetrance times line density times frame rate is going to be equal to speed divided by 2. And if that speed is 1,540 meters per second, you divide it by 2, we're going to get this magic number of 77,000 centimeters per second. So we'll talk about some of the artifacts that can be produced from some of this beam width. And I'll start off by talking about side lobes. So side lobes are the energy that is coming from the outer portions of the beam structure. And this typically gives that kind of whiskering effect that you're going to be seeing, for instance, here in echocardiography, in your apical four-chamber view, looking at the atria. They can look kind of whiskery. Uh, this is an example of the side lobe. And it's occurring in three dimensions. You know, it's both happening in both the uh, lateral plane as well as the elevation plane.
And you can see this in the sort of two, uh, the, the, the two images that are shown in this slide here at the top. So the outer elements are going to produce energy, which is going to help form the main beam, but is also going to be uh, displaced to the side as well. And if we were to try and look at the beam intensity and sort of cross-section looking at the, sort of the upper right image, we can see that the central main beam certainly has most of the intensity, but we get these sort of side lobe energy uh, portions as well. Now these are going to be able to, these energy is going to go out and it's going to be reflected and it's going to come back and it's going to show structures um, which are maybe outside of this main beam area, but the machine doesn't assume that. It assumes that all the reflections are coming from the main beam, hence the whiskering. The way that we can try and reduce this is through a, a concept known as apodization. And basically all that is, is you're just reducing the strength of these side lobes. You're reducing the strength of these outer elements. And we can do that both in reducing the electrical strength of the outer elements versus the inner elements in terms of reduced amplification. And you do that both in transmitting it and in terms of receiving the echoes, where you can amplify the central received echoes more than the outer uh, received echoes. This has a problem in that it increases the beam width, which means that you're going to get decreased lateral resolution. Grating lobes are another form of these side lobes but it's all to do with the multi-element structure and that the sound waves which are coming from the sides, from these outer elements, we're going to get some construction interf interference coming between sound waves that are a certain distance apart. And again, just trying to remember when we were talking about you know, speckle formation in the, in the, as the sound waves sort of get scattered, we're going to, and sometimes those sound waves that are scattered, they can form together to be constructive, or they can, uh, if they're out of alignment with each other, they'll be completely destructive. But the grating lobes is happening when we're getting this multi element structure production of the sound waves with the side lobes, where we get the sound waves coming together in a constructive pattern. How do we deal with it? Well, again, we can have sort of the non-uniform driving or non-uniform amplification of the sound waves, both in transmission and reception. But we can also try and do it by the positioning of the elements. So we can make sure that those elements, the distance is less than 0.5 of a wavelength apart, will mean that as the sound waves are produced, that will minimize their constructive uh, interference uh, formation. So in summary about beam widths, the ultrasound is assuming the beam width to be a very thin line, but it's not. It's got three dimensions. And there is going to be a minimum distance between structures in that beam width to try and tell them apart, both in an axial resolution, as well as a lateral resolution, as well as an elevational resolution. Typically, your axial resolution is going to be the best. So your axial resolution will be better than your lateral resolution and will be better than your elevational resolution. In terms of detail resolution, it's also important not to just to consider the distance that things are apart, but also how they move. So there's, that's where temporal resolution comes into play. And that's all to do with frame rate. And frame rate is dependent on penetrance, or the depth you're trying to image a structure, as well as the line density of an image. So if you want to improve your frame rate uh, of an image, then you need to either reduce your depth and or, or reduce the sector width. And finally, beam widths are going to have certain artifacts that can be produced in terms of slice, in terms of side lobes and grating lobes artifacts, as well as slice thickness. And these occur because of uh, echo intensity that's sent from the outer portions in particular and the grating lobes which can be sent from a constructive interference that can happen between, uh, between uh, sound waves. And we can reduce these through processes like apodization and making sure that our transducer elements are not, uh, that are less than 0.5 uh, of a difference in the wavelength apart.
So thank you very much. I hope that was useful. Um, see you at the next one.